Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wasn't aware there were computers 100 years ago. Must be Ada Lovelace. <laughs> okay. It's easy to save money, by the way, doing open source. Easier than earning money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right, you can essentially sell uh, fire insurances. Um, I think I, I I think I lost you, but I don't know whether it's um, your side or not because I'm I'm having a pretty good ping. Is this something that fixes itself? Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I was saying that the, the ping looks good uh, on this side. So anyway, it may be just the weather. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> yeah. Just five hours ahead, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> not that far in the future, not far future. <laughs> um, so um, just a couple of things. Uh, so while, of course, I'm digitalminister.tw, uh, I'm also uh, still a hacktivist. I'm um, kind of starting new ventures too, uh, working with, say, Vitalik Buterin uh, and Glenn Wild, Danielle Allen and friends in a New York uh, international NGO, uh, the social innovation organization called Radical Exchange. I, I'm still on the board of uh, you know, the Council Democracy Foundation uh, in Amsterdam, uh, which started from the 15M uh, Occupy movement in Spain, uh, and many other things. And so uh, I, I'm a slushy. So Digital Minister TW is just one of my titles. Uh, but that being said, uh, I do believe that the main contribution I bring to the table, um, what drove me, if you will, uh, is that when 
when we occupied the parliament in Taiwan in 2014, that was the first massive demonstration that's not just a protest, but also a demo in the sense of a demo scene, right? A, a demo, a, a demo that shows with half a million people on the street, many more online, people can intelligently have a conversation with assistive collective intelligence or ACI um, with listening and skill um, tools. Uh, people who have never been to a internet engineering task force meeting can nevertheless, if well facilitated, hum into rough consensus on important issues such as the trade deal with Beijing being deliberated on the street at the time. Um, after three weeks of Occupy, we eventually agree on a set of demands uh, and which got accepted by the head of the parliament. And so people cannot unsee that scene. They cannot unparticipate uh, from that feeling that uh, actually some sort of participatory democracy is not just possible, it's also fun. Uh, and so the value that I bring to the table is mainly to introduce the career public service who are very much in this, uh, into this because they understand this reduce the risk. If the agenda is set by the whole population, there's almost zero risk for the career public service to implement the will and the mandate of the people. But they were afraid that it would be very time consuming. They were afraid that they will be sidelined. They were afraid that it become populist and exclusionary. They were afraid that it will lead to polarized um, communities and so on. So, so the and and we do have that in open source too. We had all of that too. In, in open source, we had religious wars, right? Flame wars. Uh, and um, we also have some experience in how to merge after the fork. A lot of open source philosophy is just on how to merge after a fork. Uh, and that is the value that we bring to the table as a young reverse mentor, freshly retired from the business sector um, into the public sector and as a kind of part-time consultant. And nowadays, of course, I'm ostensibly working full time, but while in my copious uh, free time, also uh, mentoring some not-for-profit startups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I went in saying that I'm a public servant to the public service. I'm here to A, save you time, uh, B, reduce your risk, and C, increase trustworthiness. Uh, and we can't do everything, like all three of them, at the same time. But I um, agree and I promise that I will not increase uh, the risk or uh, waste people's time or uh, reduce people's trust at the uh, benefit of some other people's uh, time or risk or trust. And so these are um, Pareto improvements. That's the uh, technical term. I make improvements on one of the three axes, but never at the expense of the other two axes. And also the secondments, that is to say public servants that volunteer to work with me, but not for me, because I give no order and take no order. Uh, they understand they have to come up with the ideas, but I will absorb the risk. And so that sort of collaboration, a horizontal team, if you will, um, is quite um, difficult to imagine unless you've actually participated in it. So most of my first uh, work, aside from recompiling the Linux kernel so we can run Sandstorm and things like that, <laughs> was just making sure that the personnel, they, they, uh, if they refer to me as minister, I simply pretend I didn't hear it uh, and until they uh, refer to me as AU or Audrey. Uh, and then uh, we start building the culture kind of from the kernel of just maybe 20 people in the office but then gradually into a horizontal network of more than 100 uh, participation offices and interns and things like that so it grew kind of organically and gradually but I never forced any ministries to associate them with me so as you mentioned the Ministry of Defense never sent anyone to my office I still knows nothing about the military <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
That's exactly right. Yes,、uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs didn't send anyone for the first year, but on the second year, they decided to develop their Twitter game.、Uh, and turns out that there are parts in diplomacy called public diplomacy <laughs> that really benefits from the open innovation model. So they started sending people to my office. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say it's the norm actually in the judiciary branch, and it's probably the same for you too. I mean, the legal opinions,、uh, the regulation text themselves, they are not subject to copyright. Um, because if it would, only very wealthy people have access to justice,、uh, and then、um, the proceedings, unless it's uh, for uh, reasons that、uh, pertains to privacy or trade secret,、uh, usually the court proceedings are、uh, in the public domain as well. So I would say the entire judiciary branch, all the way to the constitutional courts, work on the open innovation model that delivers the legitimacy. Because of the radical transparency,、um, and in Taiwan, our parliament wasn't that transparent. But after it gets occupied, it becomes really transparent really quickly、uh, with with live streaming and all.、Uh, and so, in a sense, this is the executive branch, the administration, catching up to the、uh, legislation and the judiciary branches when it comes to the radical transparency.、Uh, when framed this way,、uh, people, because in Taiwan. We only have our first presidential election in 1996,、uh, which is after the World Web.、Um, that means that in people's mind, there's no hundreds of years of、uh, Republican or Democratic tradition.、Uh, from the very beginning, it's intertwined with the Web. So people think, yeah, sure. Why don't we reconfigure our、um, constitution? That's our kernel. Why don't we recompile it five times? That's five constitutional amendments. We're deliberating one、uh, right now.、Uh, and so everything is is you can change it like the software. Design or integrated circuit semiconductor design,、uh, which of course the M1 chip did pretty well, I guess, with the TSMC.、Uh, and so, and so the the constitution and the、uh, regulations around it are seen as technology. Democracy is seen as a technology, and I think this is important because、um, for many people, if、uh, the like two hundred years or more of Republican or Democratic.、Um, Uh, tradition is already like in the、um, ancestors. Then it tends to fossilize. But in Taiwan, this is all within our lifetime. As to remember the martial law,、uh, and so it means that it is maximally hackable, if you will. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a as a of course pioneer or or as research, but on the other hand, twenty、uh, three million people isn't really、um, a small country. <laughs> It's actually quite large population wise,、uh, and so I think we have the best of both worlds. We have a、uh, kind of、um, easy to travel、uh, landscape. The western part of Taiwan, especially from the northmost to the southmost, is just barely ninety minutes、uh, by by high speed rails. So people. Can experience each other's realities quite easily, but then we have 23 million people. So any model that worked here is much more likely to scale to other jurisdictions as compared to maybe just a two million people、um, jurisdiction. And so I think、uh, the kind of R and D advantage of Taiwan、uh, lies both in the shared reality, but also in the larger population. Hmm. Uh, but but they all have broadband. If if they don't have broadband anywhere on the top of Taiwan or on the small islands as we refer to, if they don't have ten megabits per second、uh, both ways at just sixteen euros per month, that's my fault personally. Yeah, it's broadband is human right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm.
Yeah, I, I, I was born in martial law, as I mentioned. <laughs> and so uh, we, we understand how's it like. Pe yeah, people were, were encouraged even uh, in my parents' and grandparents' time to, to even snitch uh, on each other. It's a very bad state surveillance um, called uh, the white terror. Uh, and the, I think it extends for like four decades or something. So the world's longest martial law uh, period. And so we, we understood how, how bad it was. And so we, we don't want to go back there. <laughs> and that is why the Civicus Monitor uh, Human Rights um, Group rated Taiwan really as the only place in the whole Asia, uh, the only jurisdiction that scores completely open when it comes to the rights of assembly, right of speech, and right of uh, press, and so on. And, and this is important important because this is built upon the kind of negative liberty, like freedom from state surveillance, freedom from nowadays multinational uh, uh, corporate surveillance and, and things like that. So, so I would say that both the positive and negative liberties are highly valued. And whenever people want to start a argument based on the kind of instrumental value of convenience or things like that, um, it's a non-starter. People would just say, the counter argument would be, do you want to go back to white terror? Uh, and then and the people are like, okay, of course not. Uh, so that's how we, for example, uh, fought off the pandemic uh, with the heuristic saying, the state must never collect any data that we were not already collecting before the pandemic. So not using the pandemic as a data collection excuse. Um, and that's how we fought the infodemic uh, without resorting to things like, with all due respect, NetsDG. Uh, so we, we didn't take anything down uh, for the infodemic, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, for people uh, around 40 years old or older, yes. The younger uh, generation doesn't remember martial law anymore. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and actually, we just had a negotiation with Facebook on the topic of uh, advertisement during election. And last year, I think Taiwan is the first jurisdiction that they really published the advertisement library in real time as structured open data for independent analysis so that dark patterns will be uh, uncovered in due time, uh, in real time, actually. And also, they ban uh, the foreign-sponsored um, advertisements uh, during our election uh, season as well. So all the advertisement pertaining to political or social issues need to be domestic in nature, just like our campaign uh, finance law. And the remarkable thing is that we did that with no jurisdiction over Facebook at all. And we didn't change or pass any acts related to that. We just basically said our campaign donation expended to our, well, even the counting process uh, is to be made immediately open, like open um, data. And because of that, it creates a social norm, a social expectation. And those advertisements on Facebook back in 2018, mayoral election, these kind of become a, a uh, bypass because uh, we analyzed the data in 2018 and very few, if any, candidates filed their social media campaigns as campaign donation or expenditure. So obviously it's a way for foreign interference to, to uh, enter without any auditing or accountability. And so we basically said to Facebook, look, there's two choices. You can either publish the same as we do for the campaign finance and treat this as campaign finance or even if we have no jurisdiction over you, you may face social sanction. And there are legitimate alternatives, such as the PTT, uh, which is the social sector maintained by national Taiwan University students, um, alternative to the Facebook and so on. There's also Dcard and many others. Uh, and because of that, Facebook eventually uh, shifted their mind and then they started doing advertisement transparency. Um, I uh, use this very long example just to um, um, say that when we say uh, people, public, private partnership, we always put people and therefore the social sector first.
Well, it, it, it didn't have that much uh, influence during our presidential election, so we didn't have that conversation. But uh, if it proves to be an issue uh, in our next uh, like national referenda or election session, uh, then of course we are going to have the same conversation. Oh yeah, definitely. That that's what we occupy the parliament for. That's one of our demands. Yeah, one of the consensus that we formed uh, on the street, which essentially is that there is no private sector vendor uh, coming in from the PRC. And uh, if uh, we get into 4G using those components, then every now and then we'll have to do a systemic risk assessment on uh, whether there has been a de facto takeover by the party uh, from the PRC side. And amortize, that's going to be much more expensive than just going to uh, you know Nokia or Ericsson or develop some of our own. Uh, and so the decision was made then uh, to uh, exclude PRC in all the procurement, not just telecoms, but also anything pertaining to sensitive data data or cybersecurity or national security or things like that. And by 2015, I think we uh, erased all the components from PRC. So that's five years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, in all our procurement tenders, uh, this is making uh, sure that the PRC supply chain do not take a hold uh, in any of our uh, ICT facility. This, of course, only pertains to things in the data pipeline. So I, I don't know about, um, for example, the medical masks. Uh, I mean, we produce uh, a lot of medical masks locally, but we're not banning PRC medical masks. They're still, they're, they're still quite helpful. Yeah. <laughs> like 5G antenna or entire Raspberry Pis, you know. <laughs> I've seen those videos. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's getting easier nowadays, though. Uh, and I think uh, nowadays uh, the Taiwanese companies, even when they manufacture some of their parts in the PRC, they aim to do so for primarily PRC um, audience, uh, PRC customer. More and more customers uh, elsewhere in the world are asking for a different supply chain configuration. And this trend has been accelerated uh, during the COVID and during the few months uh, where the PRC was not at capacity. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this trend is increasing. Uh, we see more and more manufacturers uh, essentially maintaining two supply chains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right, yes. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, one one is primarily for uh, their uh, productions that's uh, ultimately targeting the PRC market, and the other one that's for the non-PRC market. Well, at, at this moment, uh, the Taiwanese public service uh, is free to use whatever word processing uh, software as long as it produces open document, period. Um, and, and so I'm sure Office 365 also produces open document. Uh, that's that's my <laughs> right? that's my position. So so um, in 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 essence, what we're saying is that we want to do everything to ensure the freedom from vendor lock in, uh, especially uh, in education sectors, uh, where if the vendor lock in sets in during. Uh, people's like digital competence um, curricula, then essentially it creates a generation uh, of people beholden, uh, like locked in uh, to particular vendors, and then we can't have that. And this is not just uh, about Microsoft, this is also about pretty much every other proprietary software vendor. Now, I don't have anything against PowerPoint, uh, but I will simply say that if we lock people in to particular features of PowerPoint that can't be expressed in liberal office, uh, then uh, we are in real trouble because then it builds a kind of vicious cycle. Yeah, as I mentioned, the literally first technical thing I did as digital minister four years ago was to recompile the Linux kernel uh, in the government uh, cloud uh, so that I can run Sandstorm. And later on, I would get uh, the best and brightest, which would uh, went on to win the second place in DEF CON uh, the next year uh, in the uh, DEF CORE uh, in Taiwan to do a thorough penetration testing of the Sandstorm uh, system, uh, which they filed three CVEs. Uh, and after that, we're pretty sure that this is secure because it's a security product. It's safely uh, sandboxing and pretty much all the productivity software, uh, the spreadsheet part, the uh, EtherCalc, I personally maintain uh, and uh, into the office workspace. So Sandstorm, while it's not um, like centrally developed, nevertheless pieces together sufficient amount of new innovations like the um, HackMD, which is also a Taiwanese uh, team, uh, and then we just repackage it into CodeMD uh, within the Sandstorm system. So uh, it's a cloud service. Of course, you want to collaboratively edit Markdown or uh, reach text. It has to be um, like cloud hosted, but it doesn't mean that it's just service as a software substitute. If anyone can fork uh, or clone uh, any of the grains in Sandstorm and modify the code and even publish their own apps, it's called citizen developer, except now it's more like public servant developer, uh, and they can develop their own applications knowing that the single sign-on, the cybersecurity are all taken care of. And so one of the most trendy uh, apps in Sandstorm here in Taiwan uh, public sector uh, is a, a simple form to order lunch boxes together, which we use practically every week. Um, and anyway, we, we have this photo 
of all the uh, lunch places uh, around the cabinet office. But anyway, I, I digress. So, so the point is that one does not have to give up control just to go to cloud enable. It just means that one needs to work more with white hat hackers, with penetration testers. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. And, and that's something that we kind of overlooked during the fork uh, from free software movement to the open source movement because we were uh, kind of uh, worried about the market uh, adoption of freedom one and two and three, which is the, the freedom to fork collectively. Uh, but really freedom zero, which is the freedom to use it for any purpose. Uh, that is actually something that we're now defending uh, much more nowadays in the time of uh, software uh, and service, uh, or service instead of software, but preferably service, but also software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right, yes. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're now entering the second phase of our uh, national digital strategy, um, and which is called DIGI, Digitization, Innovation, Governance, and Inclusion. Uh, and I would say that the digitization, the first pillar, broadness, human right, and all that, uh, we're pretty much there. Uh, there's, of course, still room for improvement, but we're pretty much there. Um, the innovation with the enabling like sandbox acts, presidential hackathon and things like that, uh, there's a pretty good room uh, for growth. But again, uh, according to the World Economic Forum, Taiwan has been for the past couple of years, uh, one of the four super innovators uh, in the world. So we're, we're doing okay. So the uh, focus for the next couple of years is going to be on governance and also on inclusion because we do not want AI to become authoritarian intelligence. We want it to become assistive intelligence. And for that, uh, all the 20 different national languages need to be on equal footing instead of just forcing people to speak perfect English or perfect Mandarin, right? So that's the inclusion part. The governance part, we are seeking and almost getting GDPR adequacy. Uh, I think the only missing piece in the uh, puzzle uh, was uh, the uh, dedicated independent data protection authority. We do have data protection authority, but not uh, a single independent national one. We were more like Japan uh, in that regard. So we're going to, I think within a month or so, stand of a kind of foundational acts for an independent DPA. And we uh, look forward to implement uh, not just GDPR, but also parts of the currently being deliberated, the EU Data Governance Act, um, specifically about data collisions and collaboratives. That is the part that we're also very interested in. California too, although it's not yet a country. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think disruptive innovations to me is best when it disrupts the technological sector rather than disrupts the society. Uh, because things that are disrupted to the society usually uh, have a large impact, but negative, uh, with a you know, minus sign <laughs> to it, uh, while the, the truly disruptive, uh, but to the technology sector, but beneficial to the society innovations, such as, for example, just today, right, Ethereum switched from this 
old um, carbon <laughs> dioxide burning uh, proof of uh, work to proof of stake uh, for the mainline Ethereum 2.0. It's really good, but it's disruptive, I guess, mostly to the Ethereum developers. <laughs> but it is uh, just a environmental friendly gesture to, to everybody else. Um, actually, the term open source itself was such a disruptive innovation, disrupts the industry, but at the benefit of the community. So uh, in that vein, uh, I would guess that in the next few years, we'll probably arrive to the point where the co-presence of realities can enable the liberation at scale, even without people taking high-speed rails um, to enjoy each other's company. That is to say, a face-to-face -face like meeting uh, and past the flying past the Uncanny Valley uh, will enable us to talk not just about the epistem, not just about the knowledge as we are doing now, but also about the affect, the feelings, the ambience, and things like that, which at this point is unable to transmit over two-dimensional glasses such as this uh, very one. I mean, we can project some gestalt to it, but it doesn't really work. Uh, and so uh, some sort of co-presence technology, I think, would be quite uh, inclusive uh, in addition to disruptive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Uh huh. Okay, definitely, definitely we'll, uh, I mean, I have xrspace.io glasses with me. It's just in the next room. Uh, and it's pretty good as VR glasses go. And I also tried Magic Leap, uh, although the you know, viewing field could be larger. Uh, that's definitely the place to go. Yeah. Uh, the, the VR one it doesn't have this problem because it's essentially taking lights in and reprojecting. That's what XR space is doing. No, no, no. The, the XR space is really lightweight. I can wear it for like three or four hours. And it doesn't use a controller. It's purely gesture. So uh, I think it's, it's pretty good. Uh, it really redefines uh, to me the VR experience because previously I was like you. I, I can't do this more than one hour. But with XR space, which is like built in 5G, really lightweight and gesture only, uh, I can do this for, for hours. Awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, glad, glad to catch up. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm Definitely, and I'll send you a copy of my local recording. And if you can send me your local recording too, that would be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Live long and prosper. Bye.